أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي so it's February, which means that love is in the air. Um, or at least that's what um, flower shops and chocolate shops want me to believe. Uh, so I want to talk about what is love, um, what is not love, and inshallah, what should we be seeking um, when we do seek uh, a spouse or um, you know, a life partner, inshallah. Now, I want to begin actually by talking about what is not love. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of what we see in the media, what we see in movies, what we see, what we read in books, uh, is actually something other than love. Uh, there's a statement by uh, one of the philosophers that, said that says that love is a serious mental illness. Now, the question I want to ask you is this, is love really a serious mental illness? Well, I want to argue that love is not supposed to be a serious mental illness. That if love is looking like a mental illness, then it's something else. Love is not supposed to make us like drug addicts. So, if what we love has made us unable to function, has made us completely uh, debilitated, has taken over basically our sanity, and we're willing to sacrifice anything for it, then we should know that it's not love, but it's more like um, an addiction. It's more like slavery. And so there is some, a concept that we're told about in the Quran called, called Hela. And Hela can, you know, often trans, it's trans, usually often translated to, to be desires or lower desires. But how it is in general any inclination that I have internally, either emotional, you know, intellectual, whatever. But the problem is this, that a lot of what we see as and, and in the media and, and in stories, um, and it's called love, is actually not love as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has has described love, but it's actually hella. It's actually nafsani, it's from the nafs. And what happens is that the heart begins to uh, sort of worship something other, something else, or something else becomes competing with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah describes the people, there's a group of people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that they take their hella as their edaf. So what that means is that they, anything their desires tell them to do, they obey. So this is a person who, uh, regardless of morality, regardless of right or wrong, they will do anything that their desires command them to do. And if, even if that means uh, doing what is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's why it's described as a form of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they've taken their hawa as an ilah. And you know, an ilah is something, you know when we become Muslim and we say, and as a Muslim we say many times a day, every time we pray, we say, la ilaha illallah. There is no ilah except for God. What is an ilah? An ilah is something that you worship. An ilah is something that you obey. An ilah is like a deity. It's something that's, that basically your entire existence revolves around. Now there are people who make their desires into that. These are the people who, whatever their desires command, they obey. And this is actually the culture that we live in. It actually commands you to obey and to worship your hella, to worship your desires. You know, um, you know the Sprite ad, obey your thirst, right? Um, the idea here, and, and actually this is, this is um, something which is, this is, a, this is just uh, one of the ways in which advertisers want to make you buy things. 
And the idea here is whatever lower urge you have, just obey it. Just um, you know, be, be submit to it. And, and so the idea even is that sin becomes something beautified. Right? So um, something is sinfully good. Like you really shouldn't be able to put sin with good in the same you know, sentence. But the idea is that something is actually more pleasurable if it's sinful. This is a culture that tells you to worship your desires. So if you feel something, you just obey it. You do it. Um, Nike. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> um, so the idea here is that this, there are people who, who, who live in this way as if they take their desires as their, as their God. And so what happens as a result is that when you love someone, you're willing to, to uh, displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of that person. That means that you're willing to engage in a haram relationship with that person because what happens is your uh, kind of like what you love and also your worship is to something other than or something hot more than your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what you do is you're you have a desire for something. And what you do is you obey that desire over the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah warns us, even when something is halal. So in a, in one of the ayats where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about love, he says, and this is chapter 9, verse 24. He says, Say, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives, wealth which you have obtained, commerce within wherein you fear decline, and dwellings in which you are pleased, are more beloved to you than God and his messenger, and struggling in his cause. Then wait until God has executes his command, and God does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. What is this ayah telling us? This ayah is something we really need to pay attention to, because every single thing that's listed in this ayah is actually halal. So I began by talking about things which are haram, something that's clearly haram, a haram relationship outside of marriage. It's clearly haram. But even within the halal, Right? Your fathers are halal to love. Your sons are halal, halal to love. Your brothers are halal to love. Your spouses are halal to love. Your relatives, your wealth, your commerce, and your house, your dwelling, all of these things are halal to love. But the warning here is that if any of these things you love more than Allah and His Messenger and striving in His cause, then that is the problem. And what happens as a result of that is um, it's it's uh, a torment in this life before the next. So let me ask you this. Would anyone in this room or anyone who's Muslim say that they love their spouse more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Probably nobody hopefully would admit that. Nobody would say, I love my spouse or I love my father or I love my whatever, um, my nice car more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet what happens is with our actions, that's exactly what, what we say or what we're doing. Because what happens when I'm, I'm faced with a decision or I'm faced with a choice and I have to choose between what is pleasing to my spouse, what is pleasing to my father, what is pleasing to my brother, and what is pleasing to Allah. And what I end up choosing is what I love most. The one who I want to please is the one I love most. Let me give you some examples. Um, one example is before marriage. Now, I might be in love with someone, right, before marriage. And again, we talked about, is that love or is that something else? But whatever feeling I have for somebody outside of marriage, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's, it's displeasing to him for me to have a relationship with that person outside of marriage. But because I have such an attachment to that person, I end up choosing pleasing that person or end up choosing be, being with that person over the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that way, I'm, I'm basically showing what I love more. Because when you love something, you obey it. And when you love something, you want to please the one you love. 
So we have to ask ourselves what it is that we really love most. And if we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, when we're put in that situation where we have to choose, we choose that which we love more. Another example, sometimes there'll be uh, sisters who, they might have a, a spouse or a family member who wants them not to wear hijab, or wants them to take off their hijab, or puts pressure on them to not put it on at all. And that sister is not faced with a decision, with a choice. And this is where, even if it's your parents, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we obey our parents, right? That's the rule. Except when they're telling us to do something which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when a, when a girl, and sometimes I've seen where sisters are pressured into taking off their hijab or not wearing hijab because otherwise they won't be able to get married. And unfortunately, what's happening in that scenario is we're putting the love of a person, the love of even getting married, above the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that way, we completely turn things around. Because what is marriage? What exactly is marriage? Let me ask you this. I think one of the problems is that we have taken marriage as if it's the purpose of life. As if it's the end. As if it's, you know, I'm living this life and then the story ends where? In the fairy tale, where does the story end? It ends with Prince Charming, right, coming and saving the, the helpless girl. It's usually where it ends. Or if it's a romantic comedy, it ends at maybe it ends at the wedding. You never really see what happens after the wedding, right? But the idea here is that the whole point of my life, the whole point of the story is to end at the wedding. And then after that is happily ever after, right? Well, this is completely wrong because the marriage itself is actually just a vehicle to take you to your end. And what's your end? What's our end? What's hopefully our end? Our end, we hope, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We hope that everything that we do is bringing us near to Him. And marriage is one of those vehicles. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about love, how does He describe it? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about love, He says in Surah Al-Rum, in this ayah, Allah says, and from among his signs, has anyone ever gotten a wedding invitation for? A Muslim wedding invitation? If you've read a Muslim wedding invitation, you've probably read this ayah. Because it's pretty much on every wedding invitation if they're Muslim. And from among his signs is this, that he created for you, from among yourself, spouses, or mates, in order that you may dwell in tranquility with them. Now, let's just stop and reflect on this for a second. There's a, there's a couple things I want to point out. One, it begins by saying, from among his signs. What's the purpose of a sign? What does a sign do? Pardon? Remind you of something? What else does a sign do? Warns you. What? Warns you. Warns you? Okay. Oh, do, what, do, what do signs do on the highway telling you which way to turn? They guide you, right? A sign is a pointer. A sign is a pointer to something. It guides you. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the relationship between a man and a wife, and between the husband and the spouse and the wife, between the spouses, is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? It means that it's a means, it's a tool of what? What is it, what is it a sign of? Who is it a sign of? It's a, it's a sign of Allah. So let me ask you this: if that relationship is actually taking me away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it the correct type? Is it fulfilling its purpose as a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If it's actually acting as a barrier between me and Allah, then is it fulfilling its purpose? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ It's a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's intended to actually bring me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not farther away. And so that's one of the best ways to know 
if this relationship, if this love is good for me or bad for me, is ask yourself this question. Does it bring me closer to Allah or does it bring me farther from Allah? Does it bring me closer to Allah or does it bring me away from Him? Because the true love as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended it is actually supposed to bring you closer to Allah. It's supposed to be a sign. Wa min ayati. The second point I want to point I, I want to mention is the, the part that says the tasqunu ilayha. The tasqunu ilayha means that you may dwell in tranquility together. Now remember when I described the type of love as it's shown in you know Romeo and Juliet and all the kinds of stories that we see about the crazy love. Does that does that look like does that look like tranquility? Do you think Romeo and Juliet were just tranquil? You guys get what I'm saying? What, what does that look like? That looks like craziness, right? That looks more like a drug addiction. And, and don't think for a moment that people only get addicted to drugs. People also get addicted to other people. We can actually be in very unhealthy relationships where it's more like an addiction. And it has all the same, you know, characteristics. What happens when you don't, when you can't have a drug for a while? You go through what symptoms? Withdrawal. Withdrawal symptoms. Have you ever seen anyone who hasn't had their fix of another person? It's like total withdrawal symptoms, right? They can't function. They can't think about anything else. They can't talk about anything else. They're completely miserable. They can't eat. They can't sleep. Am I right? This is what happens to a person who's addicted to another person. It's an unhealthy attachment. And so when you don't have it for a while, and it's kind of like you need that fix. And that's what it is. And even when you study the biology of being in love, like what it does to the brain is very similar to what drugs do to the brain. Like even in the even chemically. It's, it's, a, it's a fix. It's a high. And so you get addicted to that high. And when you can't have it, you can't be around that person, or say you can't be with that person, what happens? Well, you get withdrawal symptoms. And sometimes, suppose someone is addicted or in an unhealthy attachment or has an unhealthy attachment to another person. And they're thinking that they can get married. Right? This is what we convince ourselves. We're, 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 we're going to get married. So you go, go ahead and make a whole relationship with this person. Thinking in your brain that, oh, we're going to end up getting married. Well, there's a lot of reasons why that's not a good idea. But one is, a lot of times it doesn't work out. That's one thing. A lot of times it doesn't work out. Once it doesn't work out, that person is now devastated. Like it, it causes devastation. And the reason it causes devastation is because you have allowed yourself to get attached to something in a very unhealthy way, and it's like taking away a drug from a drug addict. And when it doesn't work out, it's, it's devastation. And in order to get over that type of attachment, it's very similar to how you get over a drug addiction. Well, you have to totally cut off from that drug. And you're going to go through withdrawal symptoms until it's basically out of your system. But do you notice, how can you tell when you have this unhealthy attachment? So that's the question. How can you tell the difference between when it is really the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends it and when it's this unhealthy addiction? The first way that you can tell is what I just spoke about, and that is ask yourself, does this relationship, does being closer to this person, does being with this person bring me closer to Allah or bring me farther from Allah? The second question you should ask yourself is this. What do you think about all day? What's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? What's the last thing you think about before you sleep? What keeps you up at night? What, what makes you most happy? What makes you most sad? What makes you most angry? If the answer to all these questions is that other person, then those are indication that you have an unhealthy attachment. <laughs> you guys get what I'm saying? If when you say Allahu Akbar to pray, and all you can think about 
Is that other person? <laughs> Some people would be very jealous. <laughs> the facial expressions are funny. People can relate to what I'm saying. That when. <laughs> don't give yourself. Okay, good. Um, if when you say hello about, and all you can think about is that other person, that's a problem, right? You have to know that that's an indication of a problem. Again, even when that person is your husband, even when that person is your wife, it shouldn't be the case that the first thing you think about is them, the last thing you think about is them, you think about them all day, you think about them when you say, oh, blah, blah, blah. When we're told that the first thing we should think about when we wake up is that ilah ha There is no ilah, there is nothing worthy of our worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing we should be thinking about before we sleep is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing we should think about before we sleep is Allahumma aslamtu nafsi ilayk wa wajjahtu wajhi ilayk wa fawwaktu amri ilayk wa ajjahtu dhahri ilayk What this means, this dua is actually, we're taught that this is the dua we're supposed to say right before we sleep. And it should be the last thing we say before we sleep. And if you look at the meaning of this dua, it's very powerful. You begin by saying Allahumma inni as Allahumma aslamtu nafsi ilayk I have submitted my entire self to you, not to another person, to you. And I have set my face towards you, not towards another person. You've given up and you've, you've given all your affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you, you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, is, is your support. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has your back. So you are basically making this dua that everything is towards him. And that's the last thing you say before you sleep. When you say Allahu Akbar and you start to pray, what are you saying? You're not just saying God is great. You're not just saying God is the great. But you're saying God is greater. God is greater. And you don't finish. Greater than what? Everything. God is greater than everything. This is what you're saying when you say Allah Akbar. And every movement that you make in Salah, you're reminding yourself that God is greater. God is greater than whatever it is you're thinking about. God is greater than whatever plans you have after Salah that you're thinking about. God is greater than whatever um, subject you were studying right before you prayed that you're still thinking about. <laughs> Right? A, a more guilty cases. <laughs> you guys get what I'm saying? That the whole concept of God is greater is that there's nothing else greater than Him. There's nothing else I should be thinking about. Now, I would say that there's sort of like two types, at least two types of love. There's the type of love which is um, you, you love a person because of what they give you. You love a person because of the way they make you feel. You basically love not the person themselves, but you love how they, what they give to you. Again, this is kind of like that fix, that high that they give you. And then there's another type of love where you love the person for who they are. And in that type of love, it's not about what you're getting from that person, but it's about what you're giving. Now the majority of love, I think, falls in the first category. Where I, when you say I love you, you really mean I love me. <laughs> because what I'm, what I'm really saying is I love what you give to me. <laughs> I love how you make me feel. I mean, the person is kind of irrelevant. <laughs> Um, it's just, it's kind of all about me. And the problem with that type of love, well, it's very, it's nefsani, right? It's, it's about the nefs, but also it's very unstable. The reason it's unstable is because what you give to me is never going to be constant. Neither can you give constantly, nor the way I accept it is constant. 
So this type of love is very um, sort of temporary, and it, it, it's going to go up and down, and it's likely to fade, fade away. Because if, again, if it's about the high, you're running after a high, you're running after what can you give me, and that's unstable. So that type of love ends, tends to be also unstable. And you, you hear a lot about people who say they fell out of love, right? What's, what's that about? Well, it, what, what they were holding on to was something that by definition is fleeting. Remember, if you're holding on to that high, that high is fleeting. That, that fix is fleeting. That, you know, the butterflies in the stomach, that, that feeling, it's by, by definition temporary. So what happens after that goes away? Well, if there's no solid foundation, the, the relationship goes away. But what is that solid foundation? This is where we bring in the concept of hubbhi sabinina, the love in Allah, for the sake of Allah. If the thing that you're holding on to, the thing that you have in common, the reason why you love, and the source of your love is Allah, is God, then that's not unstable, and that's not fleeting, and that's not inconstant. Allah is not unstable, Allah is not fleeting, Allah is not inconstant. So if that's your source, you don't run out. You don't run out of love if Allah is your source. If you love someone for the sake of Allah, that means that, for example, I love you because you remind me of Allah. Or I love you because you bring me closer to Allah. Or I love you because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me to love you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to take care, to be kind and loving to our families. So we love our families for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or we may. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to love and take care of our children. That also can be love for the sake of Allah. And if it's like that, you know what happens? Everything you give to that person, you aren't giving for the sake of what you're getting back from them. Because where do you get your payment when you give for the sake of Allah? Where do you get your payment? Well, from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you guys get what I'm saying? A lot of times, for example, in marriage, one spouse feels unappreciated. Well, this happens a lot. You're giving, and the other, other person is not appreciating. The other person is not saying thank you. The other person isn't even acknowledging what you're doing. Well, this becomes very, very, I mean, this is, this is something we shouldn't do. We should always be appreciative. But suppose that it does happen sometimes that someone is not appreciative. Now, if you're doing it for the sake of their appreciation, you're going to be heartbroken every single time. And you're going to get to a point where you're like, forget it, I'm not going to do it anymore. Right? But if you're giving for the sake of Allah, because Allah has commanded you to do and treat this person in a certain way, now you're getting your payment, your payment, your reward from, from Allah. Now, does it matter so much the times that they don't say thank you? Does it matter as much if they don't get knowledge? At this point, it's kafa billahi shahida, that Allah, is suffice, Allah suffices as a witness. When you're doing something for someone and they don't acknowledge it, and they don't thank you, and nobody appreciates what you're doing, I mean, in your case, maybe you're doing something for the community, you're doing something for your family, whatever it is, and nobody's appreciating it. Nobody even acknowledges or knows that you did it. Has it gone? Has it gone to waste? Is it in vain? Not if you did it for the sake of Allah. So the love for the sake of Allah, you're ne you never lose. Even if that person is not appreciating, even if that person doesn't say thank you, you still always get your reward. Your reward is saved with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, <coughs> I want to, inshallah, leave time for questions because, inshallah, I want it to be um, interactive, a discussion, inshallah. I want to actually um, share one quote with you. Um, it's a beautiful quote of Ibn Qayyim. Uh, actually, it was said by Ibn Taymiyyah and it was quoted by Ibn Qayyim in, in, in um, Madarij, I believe. And the quote says, this is the translation, the perfection of Tawheed is found when there remains nothing in the heart except Allah. 
The servant is left loving those he loves and what he loves, hating those he hates and what he hates, showing allegiance to those he has allegiance to, showing enmity to those he shows enmity towards, ordering what he orders and prohibiting what he prohibits. Now what is this quote talking about? If, again, what's filling your heart is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what comes out of that is that you begin to love everything that Allah loves. And you begin to hate everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love. That means that you're not going to want something which is displeasing to Allah. Think for a moment right now about the person on this earth that you love most. Just bring that person to mind for a second. Now think about what it would feel like if that person were so angry with you that they didn't want to speak to you. Or wanted to have nothing to do with you. It's a frightening feeling, right? Displeasing that person causes a lot of anxiety in us, a lot of pain in us. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we feel that same way when we displease Allah? When we do something which is displeasing to Him, do we feel that same pain? If we really love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, naturally, naturally, just the way, you didn't have to force yourself to feel that way with the one you love. Naturally, when you love someone, you want to make them pleased. You want to do what they love. And you're terrified of displeasing them. That's the scariest thing to you. Now, inshallah, I'm I want to end with this, this concept. You know when we talk about Jannah, we talk about Jahannam, right? In the Quran, it describes Jannah and describes Jahannam. And when Jannah is described, we talk about rivers, we talk about you know, palaces, there's so much beautiful description of Jannah. And Jahannam is very frightening, the, the, the way that Jahannam is described, hellfire. But you know what the best part of Jannah is and the worst part of Jahannam is? The best part of Jannah is that the believers in paradise are given the opportunity to actually see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their physical eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will, will remove the hijab, the, the, the veil, and they will actually be able to see Him. And that's actually the greatest reward of paradise, is to see God. And you know what the worst punishment of hellfire is? They will never see God. They will actually be blocked off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There will be a hijab between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a veil. And Allah will say to those people, that he doesn't want to have anything to do with them. He says that he will not speak to them, he will not purify them, and one of the scariest things, like the scariest concept is this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that on this day, you will be forgotten as you forgot my signs. Now think for a moment about this. Imagine this isn't your mother, this isn't your brother, your sister, your spouse. This is the Lord of the universe saying to you that you'll be forgotten. This is to the one who forgets him in this life. And this life, subhanAllah, we have so many opportunities. Until the day we die, we have the opportunity to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But once we leave this life, if there was something else that we love more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that thing will not be able to do anything for us on the Day of Judgment. That person will not be able to do anything for us on the Day of Judgment. And we're told in the Quran that on the Day of Judgment, the mujrim, the person who, was, who wronged themselves first and foremost and who did wrong, they will be willing to sacrifice their own family members just to save themselves. So these people who you love more than Allah in this life, 
On the day of judgment, you'd be willing to sacrifice them just to save yourself. So we really have to ask ourselves what we love most. And make it so that even the things that we love of the creation is a path and a vehicle to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Um, inshallah, what I'm going to do now, I don't know if we have paper that we can, because sometimes some questions people don't want to um, ask out loud. Um, but if there's anyone who does have a question they'd like to ask, just raise your hand. Um, let me just say that how we said even that, like pure love for the sake of Allah, is a very high level. Okay? Um, in fact, it's such a high level that one of the people who are shaded in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on a day when there's no other shade, is that person. The one who loves for the sake of Allah, he comes together, they come together for the sake of Allah. Or two people that love for the sake of Allah come together for the sake of Allah and part for the sake of Allah. So don't think it's you know it's like an easy thing, right? It's not it's not a it's a very high level of love. But, but basically there's different um, love, I mean there's different levels of love for the sake of Allah. I mean the pure love for the sake of Allah means I, my next has no share in it, and that's something very difficult. But the concept of love for the sake of Allah means that I love you because of Allah. I love you for Allah, and I love you through Allah. It means that, for example, when you love somebody because they remind you of Allah, and that's the, that's the reason you love them. You don't love them for anything else that they give you. You love them just solely because they remind you of Allah. You know, sometimes there's like teachers or shuluk or some, you don't know anything. I mean, there's no other reason that you love this person except that they teach you and they bring you closer to Allah. That's love for the sake of Allah. Okay? Um, when you love somebody because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded you to love them, that's love for the sake of Allah. So, for example, um, you can make your love for your children your love for your parents, your love for your spouse, for the sake of Allah. Why? Because Allah has told us to love and take care of them and treat them in a certain way. So when I do that, and I do it because Allah has told me to, that's love for the sake of Allah. How do you know that the love is for the sake of Allah? That, that might be another question. One way, again, goes back to that same question. Does my love for this person bring me closer to Allah or farther from Allah? The other question is, when that thing is taken away from me, that's really where the test comes. If that thing is taken from me, I might say, oh, I love this person for the sake of Allah, but then, you know, or, or I want to marry them for the sake of Allah, right? But then when it doesn't work out, I can't let go. Well, that's an indication it was not for the sake of Allah, because who has decided that she shouldn't marry that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see? So sometimes we say that we love for the sake of Allah, but really it's not. I mean, and it's very difficult. But one good test is when it doesn't work out, or when, when something is taken away from you, we know that ultimately that's the decision of who? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. So if it really was for his sake, then I would be content with that, and I'd be okay with it. Not, no, 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 but this is what's best for me, for sure. Oh, no, Allah, Allah knows best. And if it was for him and through him, then you'll be okay. Does that make sense? See, I knew you guys had questions. <laughs> okay. All right, are they all similar? Okay, so actually this is exactly what I'm writing my current article about these questions, this exact question. Um, this asks how do you get rid of the addiction, okay? And this other one, what strategies have you found that works when you're trying to detach yourself from someone? SubhanAllah, so I've, I've written a lot, I've spoken a lot about attachments, breaking attachments, having the heart only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything else being a means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, a reflection of our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then a lot, obviously the question comes of how do we detach? How do we break these unhealthy attachments? How do we do it? How, right? So the, alhamdulillah, um, that's what 
I haven't published it yet, but I'm, I'm finishing an article exactly about this question. How do we make it easy to let go? I mean, basically, how do you get over an addiction? How do you let go when it's impossible to let go? And the best advice that I can give you is, you know how they say that you don't get over someone until you find someone better? Or you don't get over someone until someone else comes and takes their place? It's like, you can't really, you know, as human beings, we don't really like to have emptiness. We, we, we can't deal with, like, nothing there. We need something filling that spot. So if we can't have, we're really not going to get over that person who filled that spot until we find someone else to put it there. You guys feeling what I'm saying? So that's the point. The easiest way to get over an addiction is, or the easiest way to get over an attachment is to find something better to attach yourself to. Find something better to love. If we were able to, thank you. The reason why we get very attached to these things is because we haven't seen what is better. The reason why we get so attached to this life is because we haven't really realized that the next life is better. We haven't really seen that. We don't really, we don't realize it. And the reason why we get very, very attached to the creation is because we haven't really known the creator. And we haven't realized, if we were able to see the creator, if we were able to really know the creator, and we, if we were able to know that love, it would overpower any other love. So I think that we, we get attached um, in an unhealthy way, we get addicted in an unhealthy way, because we haven't found something better. We haven't um, built that higher attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We haven't filled enough of our heart with Allah. We haven't filled enough of our heart with Allah. And when you fill your heart with Allah and the love of Allah, it will take over. It will, you know, because it's so much greater. You can't compare the two. You can't compare the creator and the creation. And when you put the two next to each other, the one that's so much greater is going to completely demolish the other one. You guys understand what I mean? And I give this example in the piece I'm writing right now. That when, when a little kid falls in love with a toy car, he sees a toy car in the store and absolutely falls in love with it. He's going to become consumed with that love. He's going to be obsessed with getting that car. Right? And every time he walks by that car in the store, he's going to have to like hold himself back from stealing it. Because he loves that car so much. But what happens if that boy sees through the window of the store and sees a real car? Sees a real Ferrari, a real thing? What's going to happen to his attachment to the toy car? Is it any more a struggle not to steal it? Is it any more struggle to, to break that? No, because he saw something better. He saw the real version. And that's what we have to do. If we could see the real life, right? This is the dunya. The dunya is the lower life. By definition, it's the lower life. Dani comes from the word which means lower. There's a lower life and there's a higher life. The higher life is the hereafter. If we could see the real version, you know, like the higher version, we would easily break our attachment to the lower one. Our problem is we only see the toy car. We don't see the real one. Our problem is we only see the creation. We don't see the creator. I told you, a lot of questions. <laughs> um, mm. One other thing I want to say about addictions, I think we need to make support groups for love addictions. I personally think that. Um, we think about addictions as just like drugs, alcohol, but subhanAllah. Um, yeah, there's other types of addictions. But I think one of the other things that, that, um, that we should do in terms of getting over addiction is just in the same way that when you have a drug addiction, you have to actually, like if, you are, if you're an alcoholic, Alcoholics cannot be, when they're in treatment, they can't go near alcohol. You know what I'm saying? Completely cut them, 
yourself off from the drug. You know when you're in detox? Detox. So what you need to do is detoxify yourself from that which you're addicted to. Detox, meaning completely cut off all communication, all your mind, just cut yourself off from the drug. And then you go through this detox, you know, and you get over it, and then maybe after that, you don't have to have as severe of a cutoff, but part of the treatment is to cut yourself off, like you would with a drug. It is building your relationship with Allah. Again, the more you see the real car, the less you're going to be attached to the toy one. Build your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Refocus your heart on Allah because the reason we get addicted, the reason we get unhealthy, uh, these unhealthy attachments is because our heart is focused on them, on them. Our heart is focused on this person. Bring your heart back to be focused on Allah. And that, that's through the kid, that's through that's through remembrance, that's through worship, um, ibadah, and, and you know, a lot of the kid. Put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the center of your life, the center of your focus. And as you build that focus on Allah, it will make it much, much easier to um, get over the false attachment. So, can a relationship that was nafsani based turn to one that's nafsani did that? Yeah, uh, it can as long as it's not displeasing to Allah. As long as it's not displeasing. We can't say that there's a relationship for the sake of Allah when it is haram, a haram relationship. We can't have a, a relationship for the sake of Allah that is actually displeasing to Allah. So if it is within what is halal, within marriage, then yes, it can be transformed, it can be changed. The heart can be refocused on Allah and it can be a, a healthy attachment. But if it's not, if it's displeasing, if it's a haram relationship, it can never be for the sake of Allah because you're displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so you said that we must love people because of Allah. Does it mean we can love anyone and make him or her a person who can remind us to Allah and marry him or her? Well, not, I mean, again, it goes back to, is this something that is for the sake of Allah, meaning that it's pleasing to Allah? You're not going to, um, one thing I actually want to point out, when you're choosing your spouse, criteria for choosing a spouse, we're, <laughs> Remember when I said that does this person bring you closer to Allah or farther from Allah? This should be a criteria in choosing a spouse. Because we have a goal. We have a goal. And marriage, we said, was your vehicle to get to that goal. Now, if you get a car that doesn't run and is going to stop and, in fact, is going to keep you from getting to your goal, is that very wise? If you want, if you have a goal and you're clear about that goal, you're going to want to use the best vehicle to get you there. So your spouse, I mean, this person is going to be the closest to you. And this person, inshallah, is going to be with you for the rest of your life. You have to be very careful what type of vehicle you're using to get to your goal. What type of spouse you're marrying. If you're marrying someone just because of the way they look, that's like getting a car that looks really nice but doesn't even start. Where is it going to take you? <laughs> it's not going to take you to your goal. And eventually, guess what happens to that car? It's going to rust and it's going to fall apart. That's just the way we are. This is, a, this is a body that's going to pass away. And with every year, it gets older. 
Nobody can escape aging. No, you know, Angelina can't, nobody can. You know what I'm saying? You can't. So the point is, think about, be wise in your decision. Everything is passing away. All that's going to matter is the substance, the heart. And, and if you want your heart to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want a spouse who's going to help you with that, with that journey to Allah. How do I know that person is the right one for me? And let's say if I'm not good enough to apply stands for okay. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of choosing a spouse, so I talked conceptually about how to choose a spouse, someone who will help you in that journey. But suppose there's like a million religious people, a million people who seem pious. How do I know, you know, who to marry? And I want to just take a moment to talk about istikhara. Uh, the concept of istikhara is you know, the prayer that we make when we're trying to make a decision, to help us make a decision. I highly, highly emphasize, I highly, like, it's very important that when you're trying to choose a spouse, trying to choose a career, trying to choose a major, that you pray istikhara. Istikhara is uh, two rakahs that you pray that are nafad and you make the, the intention of istikhara and then there's a supplication that you make uh, after that. Now the thing with istikhara is this, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you basically. You're asking that if this thing is good for you, to make to put barakah in it, to put blessing in it, and to make it easy, to make it happen. And if this thing is not good for you, to take you away from it, and to take it away from you, and to take you away from it. And then to bring what is pleasing, what is good for you, and make you pleased with it. The du'a of istikhara is really perfect. But the problem is how we go about understanding istikhara. A lot of people have a lot of ideas about istikhara. Uh, for example, people think that, that you're supposed to see a dream, definitely, and that's the answer to istikhara. The answer to istikhara does not need to come in the form of a dream. Um, even when it comes to dream interpretation, it's not an exact science. So we have to be careful when we think, when we look for uh, the answer of Estefada as, as if it's going to be a, like a sign in the sky, a lightning, lightning is going to strike, or whatever. The answer to our Estefada comes in what ends up happening. Because think about what you're saying in Estefada. You're saying, Allahumma kunta da'ala, and nahad alam, khayyum li fi dini wa ma'ash wa aqibati amri faqdurhu li wa yassirhu li fi mabarikhi. You're saying, if this thing is good for me, in my deen, so in this life and the next, okay, in my deen and my dunya, then فَقْضِرْهُلِي وَيَسِرْهُلِي ثُمَّ بَرِهِ فِي Two things. Make it work out, right? Um, make it easy for me and put blessing in it. Three things. None of those things have to do with seeing a light in the sky or some big sign. What you're asking is, if this is good for me, make it happen. And make it easy and put blessing in it. So suppose you pray Istikhara, and then after that, everything is working out smoothly, you know, everything is kind of, it just works out. There's your answer to your Istikhara, Then after that, you say, when put the ta'lam and the head along, shalom li fi dini wa ma'ashi wa akibati amri, fasrifu anni wa srifni anhu, wa qdurli khayr haifu kentu mardini. So if you know that this thing, you say to Allah, if you know that this thing is not good for me, is bad for me, shalom me, is evil for me, is bad for me, fi dini wa ma'ashu akabutu Again, in your deen and in your dunya, then take it away from me. Look you guys, you're making this du'a to Allah. If this isn't good for me, take it away from me. And take me away from it, and then bring me what is good for me, what is good, and make me pleased with it. So you pray your istikhara. Now remember what you just made God for, okay? You pray your istikhara, and now nothing's working out. Obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, struggle after struggle after struggle. Could that be the answer to your istikhara? But here's what we do. We latch on to things. We latch on to things, and then we pray istikhara. 
and it, we're not really praying to God. We want a certain thing, and it could be taking us all over the place. You know, like think about a person holding on to like a roller coaster hanging off the moon, and it's just going up and down. You just won't let go, and it's just whipping you around. Do you ever think that maybe this is the best for you, and that this is the answer to your istikara? Because you have asked a lot, if it's not good for me, take it away from me. Well, here it comes and takes it away from you, and you still don't want to let go. You say, no, but I saw this sign, and I saw this dream. It's like, no, your, your istikara is answered in what happened. If it's obstacle after obstacle, after obstacle and it's not working out, let it go. And see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe it will come back to you, maybe it won't, but you put your trust in Allah. I ask Allah to take it away from me if it's bad for me. He took it away from me. So now what should I do? I should know that He took it away from me and that's best for me. Does anybody want something evil for them? Any shark to come to them? Does anybody want something that's not good for them? Can you raise your hand if you want evil to something evil? Do you want bad things? No, nobody does, right? We all just want it. We just want what's good. But our problem is that we don't see what's good and what's bad. We have, you know, we're blindfolded. We don't actually know the future. We don't know the unseen. We don't know any of these things. So when we get attached to something, it's our, you know, it's our own self-attaching. Our nefs attaches to it. Does that mean it's good for us? No, not necessarily. So we have to be willing to let go and to under and to let it, you know, give it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what istikhara is about. So when choosing a spouse, pray istikhara. Continue, I mean, you pray istikhara as you're moving in a certain direction. I'm not saying you don't act at all. You act. You know, you try, you, you work, you work at it. But suppose you're trying, they're trying, you're praying istikhara, and it's not working out. We have to put our trust in Allah that perhaps this isn't, isn't best for us. Make sense? And the same applies, by the way, for everything in life. The same applies for choosing your career, the same applies for every motion in your life, for every, um, I can't believe this pile, but let me, for every, um, you know, even if you're choosing your, your, your major, put it, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to what's best. I know marriage is a masif, but how do you go about finding someone? You actually need to put in the effort, also it's difficult to fight for love, or you just leave it up to Allah. So this, this was kind of, the question said, um, also is it acceptable to fight for love, or do you just leave it up to Allah? And that's kind of what I just talked about. You, you put in your effort, okay? The first question was about putting in effort, or do you just leave it up to Allah? There's two things that need to happen at the same time, simultaneously. One is you put in your effort. You try. At the same time, you put your trust in Allah. You know, tying your camel securely, you all hear this, right? The, the companion who didn't tie his camel, the Prophet said, why didn't you tie your camel? He said, I trust in Allah. He said, tie your camel, the Prophet said, advised him, tie your camel and put your trust in Allah. Do the same, do the two at the same time. So you do your effort, that's tying the camel, at the same time as praying is dikhara and putting your trust in Allah. So we're walking along, right? We're doing the two at the same time. I'm putting in an effort, I'm praying is dikhara, putting my trust in Allah. And as I'm doing the effort, obstacle after obstacle, it's just not working out. What should I do? Okay, I can keep trying, but what I have to realize is Part of putting my trust in Allah is that I accept the outcome of my efforts, no matter what they are. I might try for something and it doesn't work out. I need to accept that as, you know what, this is best for me. Because that's exactly what you asked of Allah. You said, if it's best for me, make it happen. And if it's not best for me, take it away. See, sometimes we make, we praise the God, we don't even know what we're saying. It's just like words, but we just, you know, go in our direction. We are telling Allah to take it away if it's bad for us. So you try at the same time putting your trust in Allah and accepting the outcome. Make sense? <coughs> okay, 
how can you tell the difference between when you are intrigued by someone's apparent religiousness and therefore you begin to change yourself? You begin to get more religious, but it is partially driven by your admiration of this person. How can you differentiate this from loving someone through Allah? That's a very good question. Uh, I think it, it can happen. Again, it comes back to attachments. Sometimes we can not realize that maybe somebody affected us and because you know they started to help us become more religious, but our attachment is through them. The problem is we need to have our attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. We need to build our relationship with Allah directly. And so we need to love through our attachment to Allah, not the other way around. You see, what, what this is describing is loving Allah through another person. We love Allah through our attachment to another person. Whether it's a shaykh, a teacher, a, a friend, a spouse. It's kind of like we love that person and that person loves Allah, therefore we love Allah. No, we should love Allah and Allah loves something, so therefore we love it. Do you guys see the difference? We shouldn't be loving through anything else. We don't love Allah through the creation. We don't love Allah because such and such person does or through that person. Make sure that your relationship with Allah is direct and that everything else that's loved is through Him, not the other way around, where Allah is loved through the creation. Does that make sense? So, bottom line is the attachment should be through Allah, not through the person. So should I take one more? Salatan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs>